go ahead and get going. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and we're about to open up a new Dharma Door. Uh, we're going to start a new sutra tonight. Uh, we're still working from the Treasury of Mahayana Sutras, edited by Garma Chang. I uh, lost my cover. That's about shredded. The yellow book now. Uh, so uh, if, you're, if you have the, the Treasury of Mahayana Sutras book, which I know many of you do, we're on page 256. Sutra number 14 in here, yet it's actually Ratnakuta Sutra number 30. And that's right. Just to remind everybody that this treasury of Mahayana Sutras is a partial translation of these 49 sutras, a collection or anthology of sutras. Um, I don't know if they translated all of them and then edited it down to just this or if this is all they translated. Um, but, you know, it's an abridged, uh, an abridged translation of the Ratnakuta Sutra. And as we're going to find out again tonight, even this translation of Sutra number 30, number 14 in the book, even this translation is an abridged version. They decided to drop a few things. And so we're going to have some fun talking about the things that they left out, why they might have left them out. Um, I'm not sure when we're going to get to all of this fun. Uh, this might be uh, two, three nights. I'm thinking three night, a three nighter, three parter. Uh, but who knows? Who knows? I never know. You never know. So off we go into the Sumati Dharika Sutra. So if we were going to start with the Sanskrit title, we would call it the Sumati Dharika Sutra. Sumati, Sumati is our star tonight. Uh, she's, she's an interesting being, uh, Sumati. Uh, so we're going to learn more about her. She's female, so she's the sort of the star. The translation here is Sumati's questions. Sure. Uh, Dadika, Dadika, Sanskrit, and the Chinese here. I'm going to talk quickly about her name, uh, Miao Hui. Miao Hui is this beautiful Chinese translation of Sumati, which means a subtle mind, beautiful mind. Uh, Su, of course, in Sanskrit has all these beautiful connotations of beautiful, fortune, uh, all of that. And then Mati, M-A-T-I, that's our mind, our, our Mati, so Sumati, or Miao Hui. Miao Hui. Miao Hui is this uh, subtle intellect. In Ch if we were doing strictly the Chinese here, it would be a subtle intellect. That's sort of that. And then our Tong Nu is our translation of Dadika, which is a young girl. Uh, a young girl. We're going to find out exactly how young, but that is sort of the meaning of Dadika and our, our uh, Tong Nu. That is our a young girl, our young girl Sumati. And if we were going to be really technical, let's just be real technical since this is, uh, you know, part one. This is the Sumati Dadika Pari Pricha Sutra, the questions of Sumati the Dadika. Uh, and so these Pari Pricha, this is a format that we've seen a lot in the collection, which is these usually bodhisattvas, pretty sure this is a bodhisattva, these bodhisattvas who have these questions, these questions for the Buddha. That's a Pari Pricha. This is Sumati Dharika Paripricha Sutra, the questions of Sumati. All right, we, that's the title. But here's what's, here's what's really interesting about Sumati. We've met Sumati before, and it's actually how I came, kind of, uh, to, came to have an interest in this sutra. So Sumati, actually our Vimalakirti. And so we were here 
big uh, multi-part uh, Kirti experience that my did. Uh, open, opening chapter of the Vimalakirti Sutra, list of 40, a list of 60 bodhisattvas and the 40th or around the 40, 45th, depending on what translation you're using, the 45th bodhisattva in Vaishali is Sumati. And so I was like, ooh, there's a connection here between the Vimalakirti Sutra and the heap of jewels here, the Ratnakuta. And so here, this is like, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Like uh, Laverne and Shirley, right? These spinoff shows. This is like a spinoff sutra kind of a thing, right? This is our Sumati gets her own, her own sutra. Uh, and so again, that's how I came to find or discover this sutra was that Vimalakirti connection. That's it. That's the title. That's how you, whenever you start a sutra, it's what you got to do. You got to explain the title. Titles explain. We're off. Uh, thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was dwelling on Mount Gridrakuta near Rajgriha, accompanied by 1,250 great monks and 10,000 bodhisattva mahasattvas. At that time, an elder's daughter named Sumati, who was only eight years old, was living in the city of Rajgriha. She had graceful features and was exquisitely beautiful. Because of her beauty and her grace, she was adored by everyone who saw her. In her past lives, she had associated closely with innumerable Buddhas, had made offerings to them, and had planted good roots of every kind. One day, this young girl went to visit the Tathagata. When she arrived, she paid homage to the Buddha by bowing down with her head at his feet and circumambulating him to the right three times, then kneeling with her palms joined. She spoke to the Buddha in verse. Unexcelled, perfectly enlightened one, great, brilliant light of the world, please, Listen to my questions about the practices of a bodhisattva. The Buddha told Samati, ask whatever questions you wish. I will explain the answers to you and resolve all your doubts. Great. I'm going to pause there before we hear the questions. Just want to pause really quickly. Um, so the elder's daughter, an elder's daughter, eight years old, right? We've sort of encountered this, like insofar as this is a trope, a uh, repeating theme or pattern in these sutras. We've seen this before, the kind of, the, the young girl, sometimes eight, sometimes 12, but it's always kind of this very uh, conspicuous <laughs> number aged young girl asking the Buddha questions. Um, so there's, if, if this is your first time, uh, the Dharma doors are kind of lately, this is, we've seen this before. So there's a great theme or a great thing about the Ratnakuta Sutra and, you know, a number of other Mahayana Sutras where there are these kind of female protagonists, very, you know, female forward sutras. This is one of them. It's another reason why I wanted to do it. Um, and I don't want to spend too long on the eight years old but I do want you to know that, you know, like, like most of the information that's in these texts, it's, it's probably very unwise to assume it has just one meaning. <laughs> or, and it's definitely, definitely unwise to assume that these are just historical documents, that there was an elder in this city some 2,500 years ago, and had a daughter named, you know, uh, subtle intellect who went at eight years old, such a young age, went to the Buddha. Like to think that this is a historical document about a historical event and just that 
yeah, that, yeah, you might miss a little with that. So already we know this is going to be operating at a number of different levels. And I just want to share with you like a, a couple of possibilities. One, of course, is that this is like indigo child, eight years old, beaming, and has such eloquence. It has such questions for the Buddha, the fully enlightened one, right? Maybe. Sure. I would definitely probably write uh, a sutra. I would probably write out a, a write out an account of such an event if a child at eight years old went and asked a fully enlightened being a bunch of really profound questions. I'd probably write that down too and preserve it for the ages. So maybe that. I have my suspicion that it also could maybe perhaps be a sort of an indicator of um, years post ordination. So like it, we have a female was once an, uh, an, an elder of Rajgriha, the daughter of, the, of that elder, but renounced, uh, became a bodhisattva, became a nun, and has been practicing for eight years and is now Sumati at least, like this Dharma name of this now initiated practitioner, Sumati's eight years old. <laughs> so possibly that, you know, because there is, and I, again, I don't want to get into it too much, but a big tradition, a big part of the Buddhist tradition and in, in so far as we're talking renunciation, a big part of it is that you renounce your family name you know, your, your government, you renounce the government name and you take on an, an initiatory Dharma name as it's called. And there's an actually Miao Hui. Miao Hui is a beautiful Chinese Dharma name. I've met many, a many a nun, Chinese nun who their Dharma name, the first character is Miao, the, the Su in Sanskrit, that beautiful, wonderful mysteriousness. Um, so anyways, I'm just putting out there might be a kind of a sign of that and or maybe Sumati is eight years deep into her Samadhi, like literally eight years deep in the meditative state. And it's at that point that she was able to generate such profound curiosities and questions for the Tathagata. And if we're thinking about the number eight as it pertains to deep meditations, well, I don't think I need to tell you the significance of that as it pertains to the various vimoksha, as they're called, the eight liberations, the four formless, or the four jhanas of form and the four formless jhanas. So there's all kinds of stuff that's going on with the number eight here. That's it. Also known for these beautiful features. This, these are graceful, beautiful features. Just wanted to point that out that the, the sutra, you know, what, what, little, what little information we're given about Sumati, what, what, what brief preface we are given to all of this, the little bits of information we have are regarding these sort of uh, features, what you could call characteristics or qualities. In Sanskrit, we might call them lakshana. And so she is sort of noted for these graceful, beautiful features. Let's, let's hold on to that. Any questions, ideas, or comments before we move into the paripricha, the questions of Sumati? Awesome, because it's so beautiful. This is such a beautiful, just exquisite little sutra. And so, in classic paripricha style, in classic questions to the Buddha style, Sumati asks the Buddha in verse, how does one obtain graceful features or great wealth and nobility? What causes one's rebirth among harmonious relatives and friends? By what means may one be born ethereally, seated upon a thousand-petaled lotus to worship the Buddhas face to face? 
How can one obtain a free command of superb miraculous powers and thus journey to countless Buddha lands to pay homage to myriad Buddhas? How can one be free from enmity and cause others to believe one's words? How may all hindrances to Dharma be removed and evil deeds forever cast away? And at the end of one's life, how may one see many Buddhas and then, free of pain, hear them preach the pure Dharma? Most compassionate, supremely honored one, please tell me all of this. Okay, so those are the 10 questions. Those are Sumati's 10 questions. I've sort of written them on the board. I've kind of written a little just paraphrase of these 10 questions. Um, it's a, in Chinese, it's a, by the way, it's a, a beautiful uh, poem in which a lot of these ideas are really woven very beautifully. And, and I mentioned that, I mentioned that about the poetics of this because you know, the, the Buddha is go also going to respond and he's going to respond in verse. And there's just going to be this like really beautiful uh, weaving and, 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 you know, just the, the way these things are answered are really beautiful. And so I want to definitely take our time with each of these. Um, I have a few notes before we even dive into it. It's like, this is definitely not my favorite translation in this collection, in this book. Um, there's a few things I'm not crazy about, and then there's a few problems a little bit later, but we'll save those for a minute. In terms of these 10 questions, um, how does one obtain uh, graceful features or great wealth and nobility? Okay, so those are actually, as we will see from the Buddha, those are two questions. One is sort of this idea of graceful features, but actually the way the Chinese can be read, I'm not going to say it's the way, it, what it says, but how it can be read is actually what is being translated as graceful features actually doesn't really appear there. It's actually about integrity. How does one, the, literally it says, how does one obtain integrity? And there's a certain sense in which that, because of the Chinese, is, is Chinese is nuanced. Grace, graceful is, graceful is okay. Graceful is totally fine. The features is a little tricky. The next part though, the second part of the Chinese is actually about a, about wealth, prosperity for sure. And, you know, honor, yeah, nobility. But in particular, it says uh, a wealthy body, a, sh a shun, a, a, like a shantida, a, sh a body, and a noble or honorable body. Okay, and I want to, well, I'm going to, I'll save any more commentary in, for the, when the Buddha answers, but I just want you to know that that's kind of what's asked by Sumati. How does one in uh, obtain integrity and a wealthy, honorable body? Hold on to any questions about that for a second. Um, number three, what causes one's rebirth among harmonious relatives and friends? That captures the sentiment. That captures the sentiment of the question for sure. This idea of like, how, does, how do you come to find yourself among harmonious friends, or harmonious relatives? How do you do that? That's the question, that Sumati's question. But the Chinese is actually this language of how do you how do you obtain again how do you obtain or reach how do you get an unbreakable retinue? And there's this language in Mahayana Buddhism about the Bodhisattva's retinue, like posse. I think in the modern vernacular we could call it the posse, and so it's this idea of having an unbreakable posse like a squad, talk about squatting up, but this idea of having, you know, a, a, you know, a sangha, but yeah, friends and relatives, but that the bond is unbreakable. That's actually the, what the Chinese is interested in, in communicating. 
Har harmoniousness, yeah, sure, definitely. But it's this beautiful language of, of unbreakable bonds among friends. Here, I'll just let you know right away, question number four and question number five, question number four, by what means? By one, may one be born ethereally, seated upon a thousand petal lotus to worship the Buddhas face to face? <laughs> That's question number four. And question number five, how can one obtain a free command of superb miraculous powers, the Siddhis or Riddhis or Abhinyas, all of those are the, the words for these supernatural powers, and thus journey to countless Buddha lands to pay homage to myriad Buddhas? How do you be born on a lotus? And how do you journey to Buddha lands? Those are the questions. Sumati's got some fire questions, right? Yeah. And unfortunately, Garma Chong and company left out the, the Buddha's beautiful answers to question number four and five. Just leave, just, oh yeah, they don't, re, they don't want to know. They don't want to know how to be reborn on a thousand petal lotus and worship Buddhas face to face. They don't want to know how to gain the supernatural powers and journey to countless Buddha lands. Let's just get to number six. So, but you don't worry, folks, I got your back. So when we get there, I got us. Number six, uh, how can one be free from enmity? How can one find oneself in a world free of anger, animosity, enmity? How can one do that? Great question, Sumati. I think we would all like to know the answer to that. How can one cause others to believe one's words? How can one be trustworthy. Great. Uh, eight and nine, actually the languages of those are a little tricky, but how may all hindrances to Dharma be removed? Um, basically the idea is like removing all hindrances, obstacles, fetters. We'll talk about it when we get there. And the number nine, how evil deeds may forever be cast away. Nah, actually it's talking about Mara, Mara the evil one. And basically how can one find oneself in a world free of the deeds of Mara? <laughs> like totally be free of a realm of Mara. And at the end of one's life, how may one see many Buddhas, and then, free of suffering, free of pain, hear them preach the pure Dharma. Yep, that's definitely about this kind of basically like death on your deathbed. How can I make sure that I'm going to be surrounded by Buddhas and hear them preach the pure Dharma? Most compassionate, supremely honored one, please tell me all of that. Okay, so those are the 10 actual questions. And we're going to get all 10 answers, not tonight. We're not definitely not going to get all 10 tonight, but we're going to, we're going to start making our way through them. Everybody cool. Anybody lost? Anybody curious about anything before we dive in? We're diving right into the first one, which is how does one obtain graceful features or again, integrity? Okay. Here is, um, so listen carefully and think well about this. I will tell you. Sumati said, yes, world honor one. I will listen with pleasure. The Buddha said, Sumati, if bodhisattvas achieve four things, they will be endowed with gr a graceful appearance. What are the four? Not to be angry, even with a bad friend. To have great kindness, metta, loving kindness. To rejoice in the true Dharma. And number four, to make images of Buddhas. 
the world honored one then repeated in verse saying harbor no hatred which destroys good roots rejoice in the dharma being kind and make images of buddhas these will give you a well-formed body an ever delightful sight to all <laughs> okay that's number one <laughs> i uh, there's so much I, I i first of all i have drawn my this is sumati of course with her her four pots here her her four uh plants with the fruit right and you know a lot of this sutra they're they're talking about in particular with this first one they're talking about this idea of of uh cultivating good roots planting good seeds cultivating good roots right so i'm going to go with that classic buddhist metaphor and i will let you know of course that these 10 questions of sumati each of them gets answered by the buddha in the same way with a four like a four part practice if bodhisattvas do these four things, they can obtain wealth and nobility, have an unbreakable retinue, and so on and so on. So we're going to wind up with 40 practices. And indeed, that was, that was sort of Sumati's question. Like the way it said it at the beginning was about, um, please listen to my questions about the practices of a bodhisattva. So, of course, the Ratnakuta Sutra is all about the Bodhisattva path, the practices of the Bodhisattva, and the, this is the Bodhisattva practice. And before we even think about this four-part answer of the Buddha, I want to just spend a minute, now that, we're no, now that we know like, what the sutra is sort of talking about, I want to talk about this idea of practice right you know we'll talk about a word that gets thrown around a lot right how's your practice going right oh my practice is really suffering like oh like we use the word practice a lot um practicing the violin right practicing patience like all of these different ways in which we use the word in english to practice and the chinese word is this word xing xing and you know, Xing is an interesting word. Um, at its most basic level, it kind of just means to do something. It's a verb. But in particular, in particular, because of the, the radical and actually even the, the, the other side of it, it's a type of doing, which is a repetitive doing. Uh, so that's the idea of a shing is like you, it's a repetitive doing and you know chinese is a, a fun weird language because it's so broad and general um that words you know they, they they'll use the same verb for a whole broad world of things right um one one that i like to use it as, as an example if you don't know this about chinese there's a great word in Chinese for um, to, to melt, like an ice cube melting. But you would use the same verb for a teacher disseminating information. It's kind of like a, a melt. And it's like, as soon as you put your mind there, right? It's kind of like, oh, that's kind of a weird and cool way to think about dissemination, right? We say disse disseminate right? We say disseminate information. We have a slightly different <laughs> thing going on there, right? So Chinese is cool. And I introduced this sort of uh, poetic nature of it because I want to share with you something. This Chinese character, Xing, which means to do something, but in particular to do it repetitively, um, is the Chinese character word for to practice. And in the Chinese for the Pusashing bodhisattva practices. That's what they're talking about, bodhisattva practices. And of course, if you think about any practice that you might have, 
you might then notice, oh, it's about the repetitiveness of it, that I get up every morning and do that at, at whatever time. Or, you know, even if it's in one yoga session, the repetition of the asana or something like that. It's so practice and the repetition of these things is, 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 is that, that's going on here, right? Well, I want to hip you to a really interesting thing that's going on. I'm not going to spend too long on it. I meant to do it uh, actually like two nights ago and I missed my, my Dharma door of opportunity. I decided to do it tonight because of, well, the questions are about the practice. And I wanted to share with you this other way, this really, really interesting other way that Chinese Buddhists use this word Xing, this repetitive action that we might call practicing. This is also the Chinese character for that fourth skandha, that fourth aggregate of conditioning, samskara, they use the same character to refer to our repetitive, diluted thinking, repeating that, and conditioning the mind into habitual thought patterns. Some people translate samskara as volitional formations. Well, volitional formations is very much wrapped up in this character of Xing. Vo volitional formations, definitely. But what gets really interesting, of course, about then knowing that, recognizing that, that these bodhisattva practices are a kind of samskara. They're a kind of conditioning. But you might, you might call it, you know, unconditioning or deconditioning or, you know, the, it's this kind of ultimately trying to reach sort of an unconditioned state in that way. But I just wanted you, because I've been using this word a lot, the practices of the bodhisattva, bodhisattva practices. These are, um, well, these are the questions, but each of them have four practices. So for example, not to be angry, even with a bad friend. That's a practice, <laughs> meaning the next time a, a friend, even somebody you don't even like maybe, the next time you maybe feel yourself wanting to get angry, it's like, woohoo, bodhisattva, time to practice, woohoo. You know what I mean? It's like to not do that is a practice. And I just want you to, again, maybe meditate on or think about this interesting connection between conditioning, conditioned thought patterns, and then a practice that you might have. And recognize, oh, it's a kind of an aware, an aware form of conditioning where I know what I'm doing and I'm kind of on top of it rather than deludedly uh, being just run through the you know, dryer cycle in that way, the dryer cycle of samsara. Oh, here we go again. Okay, any questions about that aside, about practice? Just that idea of its kind of like interesting philosophical connection to conditioning and all that. It's just a little, little aside, little asterisk. But now we know, now we know that the bodhisattva, like what does the bodhisattva do? How did, how did, like, how many hours of meditation does a bodhisattva have to do? What's the, you know, oh no. Don't be angry, even with a bad friend. That's the practice. Have great kindness. Metta, maha metta is what it says. Have, have great kindness. Just, just don't, don't even like direct it towards anybody. Just have it, just have great kindness. <laughs> Number three is rejoice in the, in the true Dharma. You know, this is sort of, I could say a lot about this. Anybody want me to say a lot about that? <laughs> like tr re rejoice, rejoice in the true Dharma. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like saying like rejoice in Buddhism. Like rejoice in the, in the teachings of the Buddha, but at a much deeper level when you really 
really, really, really have, have like, like had a realization of what Dharma is all about in terms of non-attachment and like deep non-attachment when they're like, there's nothing to have there. There's nobody to have anything there. Like all of that really, really deep, deep work about that. Right. I didn't even, I probably didn't even finish that sentence. Probably just drifted off into shunyata. So that's the true dharma. That one, the, the one that just drifts off into shunyata. And it's like, you couldn't, what? That one. Rejoice in that. And number four, make images of Buddhas. Questions, answers, ideas, comments. <laughs> Make images of Buddha. That's a great question because there were no images in the, well, in the historical content until the Greeks came along. Good point. Good point. <laughs> Yeah, I was sort of confused by that one. Is it like literally like make an image of Buddha or is it like practice such that you see the image of Buddha yeah. everywhere or yeah. So here we go. Here we go. We're going to like really start kind of unraveling this beautiful little just this one, just number one. Um, I'm not going to I don't want to spend any time on the possibility that this sutra starts off with about features. I mean, it starts off about her beautiful features, Sumati's integral, integral, or graceful, beautiful features. And the first answer, of course, is about, or actually the first question is about that, and then the first answer, rightfully so, is about these, how does one obtain graceful beautiful features and i don't want to spend a lot of time on the possibility that this is a kind of like i don't know that like that it's um what i what i'm getting at is this is probably in the beginning supposed to sound vain it's supposed to sound like, how do I get a good complexion? And it's sort of like, um, like a Buddha. Wow, Buddha, you have such uh, beautiful uh, glowing skin. It's skin, it's one of your 32 auspicious marks. What skincare products do you use? Like what cream do you use to get the 32 auspicious luxury, right? And so I think this is sort of like where the question is supposed to be like in a vain way. And then the answer is like, oh, you want to get a good complexion? I'll tell you what, don't be angry with anybody. That's a good look. That's a good look right there. You'll look beautiful to everybody you meet. If you are not angry towards them, people tend to find non-angry people very attractive. So there's this funny way I guess what I want to start doing is doing where it's kind of like happening both ways, where it's like, it's at this deep, you know, Dharma level of like the really profound um, complexion. But even this idea that you might f literally physically have a better complexion and look better to people if you're not angry all the time, <clears throat> right? Like, uh. so I just want you to see that the wisdom here may very well be operating on a very quotidian, like mundane level and this profound level. And the wonders of not being angry, even towards a bad friend, the wonders that will do for your complexion, the wonders that having great kindness will do for your complexion, the wonders of rejoicing in the true Dharma. Again, that one's, that one's deep. That one's wild. I just want to leave that one out there. And then this fourth one, make images of the Buddha. I think they are both talking about at the quotidian mundane level, uh, the reproduction of the Buddha image, um, 
I, you know, I've said this a lot in my Dharma talks in the past, you know, but I don't know how many people as a, as a Buddhist teacher, as a teacher of Buddhism, I don't know how many people who have, when I tell them, oh, yeah, I teach Buddhism, and they're like, oh, Buddhism, yeah, I don't know anything about that. But boy, that little chubby guy sure makes me happy. Whenever I see that little Buddha guy, he makes me happy. Yeah, yeah. So I think they're talking about the reproduction of the Buddha image that makes people happy and feel at peace. <laughs> and I think they're talking about um, like this kind of upaya stuff. You know, because I'm not just talking about this as an image of the Buddha. I think all of this is sort of this kind of, you know, Dharma parade. And then at the d craziest level, it is saying like, make images of the Buddha. At, at like, yeah, that wild, that wild one. Can it be like, make images of the Buddha? Like you are a Bodhisattva in some way, you are also an image of the Buddha. You took the words out. I didn't even finish that thought. And you just took it right out of the air. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I think the really fun part about this sutra is recognizing that it might be operating on those two levels. And then it's like, whoa. Um, yeah. Oh, um, uh, just one last point. It's a, it's a great point about this, um, these features, getting good features, and that the, 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 it's not really saying that in that way. The line, the, the line in the Buddha's poem, where he says that if you do those things, harbor no hatred, which destroys good roots, it destroys the good roots of your, your plants, rejoice in the Dharma, always being kind, and make image of the Buddhas, these practices will give you a well-formed body. It, that's an unfortunate one, but the, the Chinese there is capturing uh, the Sanskrit word avatamsaka, this kind of um, mir mi um, miraculously adorned, it's like, it's a wild word. It's a really wild Buddhist idea that well-formed body just doesn't really capture it. So I just wanted you to know that, that at the end of the Buddhist poem, he's saying, yeah, you do all of that. You'll have a body that'll be like, you know, the light, like, you know, light body kind of stuff. I mean, um, um, Michael, in regards of um, the body image, I mean, I think um, Buddhism often plays with that. You know, I, I've been looking into some uh, meditation texts about the Eight Kamapa this morning where there are a lot of like Dakinis. I'm meditating a lot on different Dakinis and they are described very much in details. You know, it's not only the form, but a, you know, big breasts and long hair and like, like, you know, very attractive and very, so they pl definitely play also with, with these um, attributes of the, of the form, right? So it's not only, you know, like they play with it and it, it is an important aspect of it because when we go into like, you know, especially meditations, when we go into meditations and we transform uh, um, ourselves into a Buddhist aspect, then we want to be attracted to this form, right? So, um, yeah, so I think it's because oftentimes in Buddhism, it's like, you know, you, you like it, it, you know, physical form doesn't matter and, you know, this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, anyway, it just because I had this this morning, I got very attracted to all the dakinis this morning. So <laughs> they're, they're kind of irresistible. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so um, two, on that note, kind of two, two things about the, this body. I was reading uh, uh, a week or two ago, I was reading a, um, one of these very academic uh, kind of scholarly books about uh, the Ratnakuta Sutra, uh, my, one of my favorites, right? About the Bodhisattva path, personal interest of mine. And boy, talk about missing the boat. Talk about really missing it. It was this kind of, you know, essentially a dissertation turned into a book but about the kind of like Mahayana obsession with the body, but like they, they thought they think like whoever wrote this dissertation slash book 
like thought they were talking about the like the body body and that they really actually wanted the good skin cream kind of thing and he, and it's like if you you could do that if you completely like miss the point like yeah you could read this whole suture that way and apparently people do that so on that note i want to remind everybody of the there's the really enigmatic line from the Vajra Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, of which most of this is just commentary. And there's the line in the Vajra Sutra about the Buddha speaking that, uh, that the body that the Buddha speaks of is, is not a body. That's why he calls it a body. They're definitely talking about that other body. <laughs> not, not this one that is born and dies and all of that. And as soon as you get that, that they're talking about the adornments of that body, the beauty and integrity of that Dharma body, then it's like, oh, okay, yeah, let's work. Let's go to the gym. Can I get a gym membership to go to that, to go to that gym? Because I want to work on that body, right? And right there, I did it. I did the thing, the Upaya thing, that if you missed what I did, you might think there's a Buddhist gym where they meditate and work out at the same time. Right. But then also certain attributes of the bodies um, symbol have symbolism, I guess. So, you know, when they talk about, um, you know, different parts of the, you know, big ears or again, big muscles or breasts or, you know, or when a Dakini is dancing in that way. And so it symbolizes a lot, right? Yep. Like, yeah. Okay. Thank Absolutely. You. Yeah, Jenny, you got something? Yeah. So, was it duplicate or replicate the the Buddha image? This is just make them, make them. Okay. So, and I think this is if if I'm hearing what Connie's saying too, that the well-formed body is the way to make the Buddha image. Say again. Um that through the the practice that is just oh i don't even know if i can say it again but that in making buddha images as that was like the fourth thing the third thing was the well-formed body right is the well-formed body that that in theory is being made Mm. It's being made in the Buddha image. So is that how? That was, I think, part of the point that was made by somebody. Regard, uh, it was uh, Tanya. I think Tanya finished Tanya my thought, Tanya. which was right, yeah. right in that. That was that third level. Yeah. Jane. That was the third level where you, the making of the Buddha image is like you, you sitting in lotus posture. Right. You, you looking like the Buddha you are. And so that could totally be making a Buddha image too. And is that the well-formed body? Oh, well then that really ties into Connie's thing about the, 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 yeah. the, the symbolism of these other Lakshana body parts and that well-formed body. You know, and if I could just try to tie all that together, you know, that well-formed body is definitely this sort of more subtle, poetic body that encompasses a lot of this conversation and is not this, uh, you know, workout, <laughs> the, the skin cream body. So it's like we're either totally deluded into thinking about, um ourselves in a body and therefore aging and dying and oh my god or we're kind of dabbling in some other bodies with some other properties and other things like that <laughs> yeah yes i also about this idea of like the for this first question is sort of about beauty beautification and all of that and so making buddha images you know, is also about an idea of beautifying the world, making the world beautiful. And, and on that note, you know, because we're good Mahayana Buddhists here, 
we, we know that the Buddha image doesn't need to be male or female, doesn't even need to be a human, it could be a flower, you know, it could be a whole, man, it could be a mandala, right? All kinds of no, other ways to conceive of Buddha and Tathagata and now get out your crayons and go crazy is part of the idea. <laughs> All right. Michael, question. Yep. Um, is it fair to say that the body that we're talking about here is, I mean, it's kind of a, let's call it a concept, but it is also the body that at the start of the sutra, they talk about, oh, do you want to go forward into your next life and get, you know, land in a great situation? It's that body that goes forward to the next life, right? Whatever, however that, you know, is constructed. It's not a real physical thing, but it's the thing that moves from life to life. Is that right? That is a, that's a tricky one. And it, I mean, it's a tricky one because you, you're, you're jumping ahead to the question of rebirth in certain situations, which, which is fine, which is fine. You're, you're moving us ahead. But I do want you to know, or just think about, because they're, you know, these 10 questions are very well structured and the way that they go. And so we're beginning with sort of just this, like, the physical form. Then we're going to get to ideas of rebirth and all of that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. If, 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 it's, if it's still lingering after the next one, hit hit me up again. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So without, because we're about to get into the idea, the tricky idea of wealth and nobility. So we're going to get into those ideas, but so, but is everybody good just on this idea of the physical appearance and that, right? So that's the initial question is, is how do you, how do you get a good complexion? How do you, how do you obtain graceful features and you know, the beautiful poetics is that it's going to be using ideas of appearance and beauty, but kind of doing something different with them. So wealth and nobility, watch out. Yeah. Okay. Question number two. The Buddha continued. Furthermore, Sumati, if bodhisattvas achieve four things they will be endowed with wealth and nobility. What are the four? To give timely gifts, to give without contempt or anger, or sorry, without contempt or arrogance, to give cheerfully, and to give without expecting a reward. The world honored one repeated this in verse to give timely gifts without contempt or arrogance to give gladly without expecting a reward. One who diligently practices these will be reborn with wealth and nobility. Now I can answer your question, Dean. <laughs> All right. So that is the answer to the question. So again, I, I, I kind of started the last one by saying, I think that there's a way that the original, original version of this sutra probably should have been read kind of funny in the way that the question is kind of coming from a vain point of view of like, how does one attain beautiful features? And it's like, oh, well, you know, don't be angry. You know, great answer. This one also, I feel like it should be read where the question is coming from this idea of like, how do you get money and, no, and you know, wealth and status? How do you get wealth and status? And so that's the quotidian mundane question, maybe, which is this idea about wealth and status. Call it nobility, call it a bunch of things. And so... You know, it's so fun how, how contrary to our Western 
capitalist mentality, right? How to obtain great wealth? Give gifts. W wait a minute. What do you mean? I, how do I how do I get Buddha? How do I no? How do I get? I'm not trying to give stuff away, right? So again, that's the subtle bodhisattva flip where it's like, oh, great wealth, give timely gifts. Um, the Chinese, by the way, so for timely, you know, it's this idea of like at the right moment, at the right time, you know, not just on Christmas and people's birthdays, but, but you know, because, you know, part of all of these of course, giving without expecting a reward, giving cheerfully, and then giving without contempt in these things. You know, from a, a Bodhisattva point of view, all of those undercut the giving, of course. <laughs> but what's also kind of interesting from the Bodhisattva point of view is, again, how this question of wealth is being answered with dana, dana, giving. I I would I would suggest on that one you refer to part one through five of Bodhisattva Lightning Attainer Vidyaprapta from last the last five sessions. These five treasuries, hidden treasuries <laughs> that we talked about. You know, there was a very subtle, uh, very subtle um you know, a very subtle thing going on in that sutra from, from the last weeks, which was about wealth and poverty. How, how do you escape poverty? And the Buddha was like, ooh, you want to escape poverty? I can show you where there are these five hidden inexhaustible treasuries. And it's like, ooh, really? Yeah, you can escape the poverty of samsara forever. Show me the map. Where do I find these? inexhaustible treasuries, right? So that was last week. And I would refer to you to that because I think the same thing's going on here. If we read the question as being asked from this kind of more arrogant or at least self-centered way of how do I get wealthy? How do I get status? And then it's like, oh, you want to be wealthy? Well, I'll get, I, you know, the Buddha will tell you how, how to obtain such great wealth in this world. Give timely gifts, right? Give without contempt. Give cheerfully. And give without expecting a reward. Simple, right? So that's the wealth aspect of it is that I think they're sort of doing this Buddhist thing where they're talking about the poverty of being in samsara and the kind of wealth of the Dharma, the wealth of knowledge, the wealth of these, these things. And then the nobility, same thing, really. You want people to respect you. You want people to honor you. <laughs> Give gifts, right? Give gifts without contempt. <laughs> Give cheerfully, right? And give without expecting a reward. That would that would be a make a a a noble in a Buddha land, right? That makes a that would make a king or a queen in a Buddha land. <laughs> I'm gonna I am gonna say one more thing, I think, about this verse. Um, which is regarding Dean's question about the rebirth aspect of it. I do want to touch upon that, but any, any questions about just this kind of Buddhist twist on wealth and poverty or the Buddhist twist on status or, you know, nobility. Everybody kind of see what's going on, Jenny. I just saw this as wealth, not being like wealth, like money, but like wealth with Buddha nature, I guess. I don't even know. Like if Buddha nature were a currency, I don't no, know. I mean, and I didn't even use the right words there that I was yeah. originally thinking, but 
the way that all of these are tying together and what's really striking me is the practice perpetuating conditioning and so the wealth isn't isn't monetary I don't think it's monetary. I mean, maybe I'm stating the obvious and I'm super slow, but. No, no wait. Maybe he's laughing at me. <laughs> so, no, that's it. That's it. That's it. And, you, and there's a lot of ways to go with that. There's a lot of ways to go with that. And, and I think one that comes to mind that's really kind of slick from a dharma point of view it it kind of ties in together these four practices of giving these four aspects of giving it's like it's it's about so it's about this the this um it's about this dharma about this tr these truths this truth and this truth that that this attachment this clingy wanty desiry attachment and clinging causes suffering anxiety stress it, all of it and there is this teaching the dharma that says to not do that leads to total freedom to 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 know that certainly like to to teach that and try to commute that's wealth to know that is wealth but here's the flip side jenny that ties it in with with what you said if you know that if you really 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 know that the attachment, clinginess, and then suffering, right? Well, then you recognize how money and that wealth, that's like, that's poison. That's like giving somebody poison in a way. And I don't mean giving gift, monetary gifts. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. That to try to be like, oh, you're sad? Here's some money. That's what this is saying. No, no, that's not wealth. Wealth is no is dharma in that way. And in that way, you know, that was that was some you know really raw, unpolished little dharma gem there, right? About attachment and suffering and knowing that is real wealth, right? That's so I just want to show you that I kind of tie that in together, Jenny. That. So now the idea of how giving could lead to great Dharma wealth, how giving could lead to wealth should be crystal clear, right? That's your, that's your ticket. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Let's do, this is perfect because we're going to do number three, the unbreakable retinue, right? Um, and then that'll be perfect timing so that the mystery number four and five that are not in your text, the mystery answers I can save for next week and I can finish my translation so that they'll be really nice for you. So in the meantime, question number three, the Buddha continued. Furthermore, Sumati, if bodhisattvas achieve these four things, they will have harmonious friends and kinsmen. What are the four? To avoid using words that cause disagreement. To help those with wrong views to have right views. To protect the true Dharma from extinction, causing it to endure and to teach sentient beings to pursue 
supreme enlightenment or the Buddha's enlightenment. The world on repeated this in verse. So no discord, help uproot wrong views, protect the true Dharma from extinction and bring all beings within the secure embrace of Bodhi, enlightenment. For this, you will have an unbreakable retinue or harmonious friends and relatives or kinsmen. And there, of course, you'll notice our, notor our notorious dot, 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 our notorious ellipses there, which is basically indicating that we're not going to give you the answers to question four and five until next week. Uh, so I already mentioned harmonious friends and kinship is this idea of an unbreakable retinue, a squad or posse that is totally impervious, right? Good friends, good relatives. And, oh, fine. Yeah, yeah. I never uh, finished answering Dean's question with number two. So number three is going to have to do, which is the question about rebirth. This is also pertains to this idea of how do you get reborn into a family that's harmonious with good friends? That's the friends and kinsmen or relatives. And it's important to note that, um, Dean, actually, by the way, it's important to note that because if we read the first question as the vein, like, how do you get a good, good appearance? And the Buddha's like, yeah, I'll show you how to get a good appearance. And then number two as like, how do you get rich? It's like, well, I'll show you how to get rich. This one is very much about like, how do I get reborn in a better house? I'll show you how to get reborn in a better house, <laughs> right? Avoid using words that cause disagreement. Wow. Good night. That, that's all I need. <laughs> you mean there's three more? <laughs> yeah, Tanya. <laughs> so, yeah, so, I mean, that doesn't, they're not implying that you shouldn't be able to have differences of opinion and to be able to have some sort of discourse, mm. right? Yeah, I let's mean, talk about Let's talk about yeah, it. I like, like, yeah, what, 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 how are you interpreting that? Um, I suppose that I would, there's a lot of ways to think about it and interpret it. I would, first of all, sort of, I, I guess just to, just to grab it fully, I would bring it all, I would, I would turn the dial up all the way to like uh, an argument, a total fight. And now so it it's like, the, really like, like a, like mad yelling kind of thing. Yeah. And so then the question is, is avoid using words that cause that. Okay. And, you know, and part of, I think part of what this is, is like, you know, there's a lot of different rhetorical devices that come to mind. Playing devil's advocate is one, which is sort of like, you know, to kind of poke and stir, cause disagreement just for, for its sake mm -hmm. in that way. I think that's part of this. I also think that there's just a very, very important teaching about right speech which is to be really, really on top of your speech game. It's kind of like social chess in that way because you're kind of like, oh, but if I say this, they might take it that way and then this and then it's all over. I should probably rethink that and use words that don't cause disagreement. And so I'll just on your concern, Tanya, like I think it's like, yeah, we were, you know, the Tibetans and all these Buddhists, they loved a good debate. They love the argument, the discussion. That's great. This is about like discord. Yeah. So is it also like about like, I was just thinking like when you were saying about, so like it's like right speech to like saying it in a way so that the person can hear it as opposed to react to it. Like in, you, you um, no, nope. you know, and that could be like what I like as an example. It could be like if I'm saying it in an angry way, right? 
they're certainly. not going to hear people people may not hear the actual message they might be reacting to the anger but again if i'm just like you know is it kind of is that also kind of wrapped in there a little bit that is definitely wrapped up in there a little bit absolutely absolutely it's like i said with all of this there's so many different levels and ways i think right now we're sort of talking maybe at that slightly more like you're at a you're at a cocktail party and you want to be on your bodhisattva game and so you just kind of want to avoid disagreement and arguments and stuff but at a deeper level though like deep bodhisattva practice time i would then so always a good way to think about these things is to flip it which is about like okay the, uh, the Buddha doesn't want me to use words that cause disagreement. So that would mean that he would probably want me to use words that cause agreement. Well, what's agreement? Agreement is this kind of getting along, cooperation, kind of an idea. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's even a bodhisattva move regarding one's opinions and one's thoughts and all of that, that as entitled to them as we are, as right as they may be, as all of those things go, one still may want to avoid disagreement just to avoid disagreement and just to keep things very nice and harmonious and ask oneself, you know, have I really lost anything because I didn't share my opinion there? Has the world lost out? Did we lose out? If, if we did, then maybe that was the wrong move. You know, this is Upaya. This is Rupai. I don't I have, we don't know. These are hypothetical situations, but I hope my point is there, which is like, it's even about reflecting on one's own contributions to conversations. And if you recognize up, oh, this is going to cause a disagreement, even though you might be right, right. It might be worth avoiding the disagreement. But these are things to be weighed in that way. Yeah, Jenny. Pushing buttons versus being skillful. Language is so amazing. We have so many different ways to say something. You know? Yeah. I mean, having exactly. a child, I am constantly walking on eggshells and weighing. There's no more button pushing for me. It's now just weighing time, place, space, continuum for discourse. And with clients too, I just can't believe the dumbass shit they say to me. <laughs> and I really have to take a step back and not react. And so it's such an interesting dance with language. Language is it's just beautiful. I mean, we are gifted with language and we have such a choice in how we present it. And that's that. Um, hi, Michael, I have a question because I've read in a few meditation texts at the end of um, the meditation, there's this wording that kind of says um, all all words are mantras and all thoughts are wisdom just because they appear. And and that um, that made me think, you know, like I think the deeper meaning is because mind in its essence is Buddha nature. So whatever is appearing is in itself, you know, um, appearance from of, uh, you know, appearance from Buddha nature. That's one, like, I think it's the deeper meaning of, of this paragraph. Mm -hmm. At the same time, like what you're just bringing on the table, like you could also think of like, whatever I'm, I'm saying um, should sh kind of should, in, in, should be mantras, right? Like the same thing, like act as a Buddha until you are a Buddha, you know, mm -hmm. in that sense. So whatever I'm saying in the idea of what are mantras and whatever I'm thinking should be wisdom. So anyway, that's, that's coming to my mind. And I would just tie that in with Jenny's comment about, you know, that this language thing, it's wild and the mantra, it's powerful. This yeah. language you use is very powerful and we can use it skillfully or not in that way. And 
to Connie's point, when someone says something shitty, it becomes a mantra in our mind and it's played over and over and over. Yep. Yeah, I mean, there's so much, you know, so that's, oh, so before I forget, I'm going to talk, I got to answer Dean's question. I want to go back to the rebirth real quick. He dropped a little nugget on us and I want to follow up on that the one before this and the this one talking about how do I get reborn in a more prosperous situation in a more noble situation? How do I get reborn in a good family? Right? Well, it's a, it's a little late and this is just something that, you know, part of the Bodhisattva training is getting on board with this idea. And it's this Mahayana, it's kind of a Buddhist idea in general but it's very Mahayana to talk about it the way I'm about to talk about it, which is, it's a kind of a rethinking of death and rebirth or the idea of reincarnation. And the basic idea is, is that if you really kind of are, are thinking about and kind of in touch with this, I, this Buddhist idea of no self, of this ever-changing, ever-morphing amalgamation, aggregation, as it's called, of elements. This ever-changing aggregation of elements that's never the same aggregation one moment to the next, having all of these different experiences, all of that. Well, it would seem, it would seem that the doctrine or the idea of no self of anatman, it would seem that that sort of negates or gets rid of reincarnation. The Buddha said there's no Atman. The Buddha said there's no soul, no essential self. So there's nothing to be reborn. So therefore there's no rebirth. And at an ultimate level of shunyata emptiness, that is true. <laughs> right up until then, like right before complete full enlightenment, I find myself <laughs> considering myself to be in a body with a name and a being and all of that. And so the Mahayana kind of point of view is one where, at a, yeah, at an ultimate level, there's no such thing as rebirth because there's nothing to be reborn. But at a more practical level, you could think of rebirth as happening basically with every breath. It's like your past actions, meaning what you were thinking a moment ago and, and what you were doing a moment ago, all of that has led to this moment. And then your next moment is being created by this. And so we are the rebirth of ourself moment after moment. There was a great poem in, in the collection of, uh, uh, poems by the nuns that I read, the Theragati. We are our mothers. We are our daughters. Like it's, we're giving birth to our future selves at every moment with everything that we're doing. And if you're hip to that Mahayana Bodhisattva way of thinking of rebirth, where it's like, oh, I kind of sort of get it. <laughs> There's not like the other rebirth because the soul and I was a dog in my last life and all that. It's that there was Michael an hour ago, Michael a year ago, Michael 10 years ago, Michael 20 years ago, Michael 40 years ago, Michael 46 years ago. And then the one right before that, the one right before that, that in terms of a continuity of karma or a continuity, it's no different than the one an hour ago to this one. But it happened, you know, through some crazy Bardo rebirthing process or whatever. But more or less, it's the same relationship to me. So then in that sutra, it's saying, oh, you want to be reborn instantly in a wealthy, noble family, right? Or you want to instantly be reborn among an unbreakable retinue? One surefire way to do that is avoid using words that cause disagreement. <laughs> Another surefire way is to help those with the wrong view have the right view. Just on that, this is sort of very, 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 very 
uh, related to and similar to in question number one that you should kind of encourage people to rejoice in the true Dharma. And it's like, oh, yeah, not the false Dharma, the true Dharma. Which one's that again? <laughs> it's kind of, this, this is along those lines. So you want to help those with the wrong view have the right view. So this is Samyak Drishti, the first step on the Noble Eightfold Path, having the right view, right? Well, since it's late, I'll just tell you. I'll just tell you what the right view is, right? So if you know what a view is, this Drishti, a Drishti meaning a view, it's, but in English, we would say a point of view, that everybody has a point of view. I've mentioned opinions a little bit ago, right? Everybody has opinions based on their point of view. Well, a point of view, uh, there's also this word worldview, a worldview, that a worldview might in, include morality, ethics, cosmology, where you, where you think all of this came from. Are you a big bang type of person? Are you a God, lightning bolt in the mud, soup kind of person? What kind of view, what view do you have? about where this all came from what view do you have about the meaning and significance of being alive right now what view do you have of that and what view do you have of where all of this is going this is all coming to a big uh, the big crunch uh singularity your singularity type of, like what's your view those are all views and I'm, i was trying to be kind of evenly distributed in my various views there right The Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha, is to not have a fixed view. To not have a fixed, definitive, I've got this all figured out view. That's the right view. Not having a view. Not having a fixed view. Being open-minded, being open to possibilities, being open. That's that's right anytime you've clung on to uh, uh it's this way it's that way dharma it's buddhist it's the buddha i got it figured out bye everybody it's the dharma sorry you missed it anytime you're attached to a view that's not the true dharma that's not the true teaching I, i'm doing i'm help i'm trying my best to help those that might have that wrong view have the right view, right? Just trying to create an unbreakable retinue here, folks. <laughs> yeah, Tanya. So we can't even be attached to the Dharma then? No way! No way! Or we hold it loosely. Exactly. It's a guide. It's a signpost and we recognize it as just that. That's the proverbial, don't mistake the finger pointing at the moon for the moon. The Dharma is this beautiful teaching about non-attachment. And all of those words, non-attachment, Dharma, moon, are all pointing at something. And you all know what, I, what it's pointing at. I know you do. Because when I said it, I know you knew. That it might have just been that, a second where you were like, oh, you mean... And then you maybe clung back to a view or something, but there was that moment. That's the true Dharma. And by the way, because number three, I'm just trying to protect the true Dharma from extinction, causing it to endure. That teaching, that profound teaching of no fixed view, no attached view, it's so profound, right? It, it, it obliterates all politics. It obliterates all religion. It obliterates all uh, contention actually if you really think about it um, you know if you're on your Kantian maxim on, if you're on your Kantian uh, moral maxim of make your action a universal a universally applicable the Dharma solid 100% if everybody did the well I'm gonna just you know not get so fixed to my view if everybody did that Buddha land.
And number four, teach sentient beings to pursue the, the supreme enlightenment, this, that, that. No attachment. No attachment to self, to views, certainly not to stuff, money, ladder climbing, all of that nonsense, right? But we're going all the way to Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment, which is no attachment to just zero, you know, no attachment. There it is, folks. Questions one, two, and three <laughs> of the Sumati Darika Paripricha Sutra. Part four and five next time. No, if there's any loose ends, you know, we got a couple minutes, just you know, but I'm certainly not going to get into anything new. Well, you did have that last comment where you were like, "Bam, Buddha land!" Like, if everybody didn't hold a fixed view, are you saying like suddenly we would be in like we would be in a Buddha land, literally? Or are you, I. I I could, I could only really dream and imagine in, in that sense. But I do, I, again, I'll do the Bodhisattva move real quick, which is, <laughs> which is flip it. If you flip it and you're like, oh no, but okay, what if everybody was, was firmly attached to their individual view? Oh yeah, that's called the world we live in. Oh yeah, that's called samsara. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I, I hope you're enjoying the Sumati experience here. Um, like I said, this is such a beautiful, simple little sutra. 10 questions, 10 answers in fours, 40 practices. So stay tuned till next week. I'm pass the mic to Katie. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, okay, so yeah, if you if you would like to cheerfully give a timely gift um, to enable us to continue protecting the true Dharma from extinction, you can do that um, on our website or at our Venmo, and I put some links in the chat. And um, there are two other links in the chat. One is to lotusunderground.com, which is MC Owens's website. Um, you can go there, you can sign up for his Patreon. You can also ask him about one-on-one -on -one teaching, um, which is receiving rave reviews all over the place. So um, sign up for that while there's still time available because there is only one MC Owens. He does not have- Limited this. spaces. Exactly, so <laughs> go check that out. And then um, some of, I've seen some of you at the Wise Action series, and if you haven't been coming, come check it out. Um, on Tuesday, uh, Mimi will be teaching, and her answer to how do we as meditators meet this moment is um, we meet this moment by understanding that it's not a binary world. Um, so very related to right view. Um, and then in two weeks, uh, MC Owens will be teaching. And so each, each week we do a little bit of practice, we do a little bit of talking, and we hear a different teacher's perspective on um, greeting these unprecedented times with our practice and also with our engagement in the world. Uh, so check that out. There's a link to that in the chat also. Um, and then one last thing is that, you know, it, it looks like, I remember coming to the first Dharma Doors online and we sort of thought, well, we'll do three or four of these online and then, you know, we'll all merrily march back uh, into, the, into the space and now here we are and we're kind of adjusting to thinking about being online for a little while longer. And one of the things we'd like to do is enable that kind of talking that happens like when we were all getting tea or putting our shoes on. Um, and so we're looking at online ways to do that. And if you have ideas or if you'd be willing to kind of be a steward of that community, um, send us an email. I'm gonna just drop our email in here for those who don't know it. Um, what we kind of envision is a few people who are like 
really excited about that, like the person who would hang out by the tea and be like, hey, how was your sit? You know, um, that, but the online version of that. So if you'd like to be one of those people, please email us. We're looking for a few seeds of, of community to kind of blossom online. Um, and with that, I will say uh, thank you all. Thank you, MC Owens, and looking forward to the next one. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.